I'm really honored to be here with Sir Tim Berners-Lee and John Bruce, who is from the company Inrupt, which is trying to create a new kind of data architecture for the web. And I'm a tech reporter, and I cover companies all the time which seem to own vast pieces of the internet. And as a user, you kind of live and operate in a silo where your personal data is used, stored, monetized by these companies who don't necessarily have your best interests at heart. And sometimes that data isn't protected very well. So we're here to talk about the next stage of the internet, the next stage of the web, and how individuals and businesses can try to correct the course of the web and build it better. So um, I'd love to just start with Tim. Please tell us your vision for the World Wide Web originally. So originally, so that was 30 years ago, originally I wanted it to be a tool that I could use uh, not just for looking at uh, a website. So I was working at CERN, a uh, great environment, working with, collaboratively with lots of people. Other projects that I did, as uh, software projects, I wanted to be able to use the web as a collaborative tool, really. I wanted to be able to, I, I wanted to, be able to use it in a way that it was sort of like a, uh, a, a medium where anybody who had any, any, anybody who had any information which wasn't in it could easily put it in. And anybody then in a team, for example, when we had team meetings, we should just be able to do it on the web by mixing, matching data on the web. So it's supposed to be a very collaborative tool. For, I, I was talking about uh, intercreativity was a name that didn't take off, but, uh, <laughs> but group creativity. It was about I wanted to be able to solve problems when part of the solution is in my head and part of the, your, the solution is your head and you're the other side of the planet connected by the internet. So that was the sort of, that was the sort of thing I wanted the web for. It took off much more as a pub publishing medium, but all is not lost. And, and so do you believe that you've solved those problems? And, and did you quite anticipate what the web would become? Well, I couldn't anticipate absolutely everything. I did plan originally for, yeah, for cat videos, uh, were, were part of the original planning, but Thank a you. lot of Thank things you for that. Have, things sat. <laughs> that was the main guy, I knew that I had to provide value somewhere. But the way things went, and in particular, because it's evolved into lots of different huge websites, and each of those, hu those huge websites, has, each social network has its own rules, its own, its, its own club, it runs in a different way. And so, so in fact, really, it's not a question of how the web's gone. It's for each of the properties on the web, how have they gone? And of course, some of them are, have been great places to be. Some of them are wonderful places. If you're a f feminist blogger, and some of them are horrible places if you're a feminist blogger. And so that, the, so it's really, you can't just say, what, you know, what do you think of the web immediately? You have to then look at each of these places and, uh, and think about and realize that they could, they're all made by programmers, they could all be changed, and then in a few years' time, they'll be diff different anyway. And so, we should, so it's great at a conference like this to think what actually sort of web do, you, do we want for the next web? And what's wrong about what we have at the moment, John? Oh, I, I mean, where to start, really? But, but, the, but the principle we're operating on is that the majority of the data on the web is in silos, actually. And, and to get at those silos is really difficult. To, for developers to create applications is, is a hugely difficult task. Corporations are bound by the constraints of those silos. And, and so what we believe uh, the solution to that is, and it's being borne out by the evidence as we begin to roll out projects, is that solid, actually, it is a phenomenal, straightforward, but hugely potent way to, if you will, liberate those silos, to put data out on the web in a form that makes it more useful for everybody, actually, not just we as users, but organizations that want to service us, developers who want to create applications for us. So, so it's a phenomenal construct that I think, you know, it replicates mm, Tim's brilliance founding the web, actually, creating the first version of the web. I think it's similarly brilliant that now Solid is the next place for the web to go. Now, can you explain to people who aren't familiar with Solid some of the applications? I know that you've had pilots uh, in the NHS in the UK and also in Flanders. So can you elaborate a little bit more on what it actually does? 
Yeah, sure. Well, you know, not to dwell too much on the technology, but consider solid is a way where you've got like uh, a USB in the cloud. It's where your data is going to reside, pertinent to you, and the applications and vendors, countries who want to service you, will respect the fact that your data resides in your pod, and, and generally under your permission to access, they can you can grant them access to it, and so so it's, they can service you with a, a whole raft, an array of products and services that today are impossible. I mean, it's, uh, there's no way that I can even have access to all of my data today. Most of it resides in various vendor silos. So in the world of solid, that data comes to me. Organizations can ask for permission to access to it, and I can grant such access so that they can service me in new and innovative ways. And Tim, do you think that that's what people want? Do they want to have this sort of approving every bit of data that they're giving to people? Well, I think it's partly they want the privacy, but actually, so when people come to Solid and sort of join the community, particularly as developers uh, who see the way it's going, is, uh, yes, they want the privacy that, they're not, they're, that they're, their information isn't being used to create huge databases to allow, to, to perfect clickbait and, you know, you know, to manipulate people to vote uh, for things that they shouldn't be voting for. But when you get control of your own data, it's not just that you're protecting it from being abused by somebody else, it's that you can actually use it yourself. Mm -hmm. If you've got your, so if you've got, with, with the NHS, if you have your health data, then you can go to any, anybody in the health sector or not, anybody in the family. If you've got access to your health data, you can share it. You can have a chat about it with a cousin that you always talk about this thing, with a doctor that you've met that you trust, and with the doctors that the NHS automatically trusts. And then you can, uh, and or, or somebody's looking after, if you're in hospital, somebody's looking after you, you can, you can just decide to share it with whoever you want. And so being able to share it with the, the fact that solid breaks down the bar barriers. The moment if you want to share things with, you share your photographs with your Facebook friends if they're on Facebook, or your LinkedIn colleagues if they're on. But, you have, but, but what you have to do if you want to share things with your Facebook friends and your LinkedIn colleagues and your Flickr fans, uh, then, you're, then you have to put the same photograph on each of these platforms from this picture. It's actually really dysfunctional right now. If you were so quite, and I've quite a lot of people notice that, and they, they notice it's dysfunctional. The moment they realize, wait a moment, there could be a world in which I can just share anything with anybody, then, that, uh, then they, 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 they get sold on solid and they, they start trying to help build it. And, and what about for, I guess, people in parts of the world or, or people who may not have the same sort of digital literacy? Mm -hmm. You know, there are some countries where people don't say they use the internet, they say they use Facebook. How are you going to change that attitude? Uh, well, there's two types of problem we're grappling with, right? One, one is inclusiveness on the web. And Tim's work with his foundation does a lot to, to see what we can best do, what can be best done to get more folks on the web that aren't able to access it today. And then, of course, what happens to them when they're on it? How can we behave in a way that's appropriate? All that is, is really uh, admirable work. What we're doing with Inrupt, the reason we founded the company, w was to bring technology to bear to the problem. So, so with Inrupt, by virtue of Solid, we've built an enterprise version of Solid. So, so to the question you posed about use cases, we've got corporations and governments around the world now beginning to mobilize, beginning to put Solid in the hands of either their citizens or consumers, oftentimes one and the same. And it truly is a global phenomenon. I mean, it's, uh, we, we, we've just gone version two last week, and that's a hugely important release for us because version one got it in the hands of these government agencies and corporations, and by virtue of working with them for the last 18 months, we've got to the point now where it's truly able to be deployed at massive scale. So the kind of work we're doing here in Flanders, hopefully we'll get to talk to that a little bit. The kind of work that's going on uh, uh, here locally in Flanders is hugely uh, stimulating, actually, because every citizen is going to get it's, uh, it's the way every social services, social service is going to be delivered to every citizen of Flanders. And, and we see that the world over. I mean, countries around the world are mobilizing that way. And, and uh, we've sort of kind of been in stealth, actually. Uh, and we, we, we've not really talked this way before today about what we're trying to do, in, in, in other than a, you know, a way to describe the technology and what it could do, 
Now we're more prominently describing the use cases and the kind of facility we've got to, to help folks, corporations or governments who want to evaluate it. And how important is buy-in from big tech? I know that you've worked with Microsoft, but you know the Googles of the world, how much do you need them for this to work? You know, it'd be great if they all mobilized in favor of this, and you might be shocked were you to know the kind of conversations we're having with some very big tech businesses. Uh, um, but, but I, you know, candidly, I spend all my time thinking about growing the business and, and making sure we can attend to the interests around the world without worrying over much about what the other big vendors choose to do. But, but I, I think generally, we get immense support from them. I, I don't speak broad scale about all of them, but it may surprise you to find the friends we've got inside big tech, actually. They see the inevitability. I mean, they see that the world is moving to a different place. It's impossible to sustain the web as it exists today. There's just too many tectonic plate forces at work that are going to force a change. And, and I think the more forward-looking vendors and realize that and they're mobilizing. And I'm going to bring up the term Web3, because we are talking about the next internet. Uh, Tim, I know that you made an NFT. Do you align yourself with Web3? Nope. Why? Because <laughs> <laughs> Web3, uh, with no WEB3, uh, the uh, Ethereum founder said he was using that term to mean building uh, new stuff on top of Ethereum. And, so, and so, so we're building new stuff on top of the web, solid is web protocols. It gives, it meets a lot of the, it scratches a lot of the itches. It gives, it, solid is motivated by giving people sovereign power over their world. It makes them, allows them to create their own uh, sort of first class groups, no matter who's in those groups. So it has a lot of things. That, so it's decentralized, it's about sovereignty, it's about power, but it doesn't use the blockchain. And uh, the blockchain's been around for a while. Uh, blockchains, there's some night. You can, yes, you can go and buy my NFT on a, on a blockchain. When bought the, somebody bought that NFT, there was a transaction. It was quite expensive. It was quite slow. When I interact with my solid pod, if I'm, if I'm running, and as I run, my stream of data from where I am is going into my pod and my family are following where my pod and they're watching this little blip. That is a stream of data at very high speed going into the pod. Uh, and this pod is dealing with it and it's dealing with lots of other people's data. It's keeping my run fast. Uh, it's act updating it really fast, it's keeping it sp spread in real time among the collaborating people who are looking at, at that run. And then it's doing that, it's keeping that pod private not like on, uh, on the blockchain, and it's got to be really fast, it's scaling up, and it's doing that for everybody else's pods at the same time. So Solid has got to be really fast, it's got to be really scalable, it's got an, and it's built out of web technology with a sort of plus-plus, with a few straightforward protocols added to the top of it, and you know, when you try and build that sort of stuff on the blockchain, uh, it doesn't work. Right. Uh, I, we were talking about it the other day, and somebody said, oh, there's now mention of Web5. <laughs> and, uh, and so the bright idea was we'll call ours Web X, but not somebody's beaten us to that. But we Web 3.0. Well, I did, we, did, we, we did talk about it as Web 3.0 at one point because Web 2.0 was a, a term used for, the, in a way, the dysfunction of what happens with user-generated content and the, and the large platforms. People call that Web 2.0, and so that asks, so maybe, so Web, we can call it Web, if you want to call it Web 3.0, then the, then okay. Web 3.0, but not Web 3. Not Web 3. Okay, Web I think I've got it. Yes. And just on the point of decentralization, obviously, Interrupt is a startup, it's a company. Mm -hmm. How can you have decentralization but have one company behind it all? Oh, we're, we're not one company. Well, Interrupt's a single company, but there are more businesses out there building solid servers, which is fabulous. I mean, it's all open source. We're encouraging as best we can others to do the same as we're doing. So, so the notion is to set, hopefully, an example, hopefully to help facilitate, hopefully to encourage adoption, and then we'll see where it all ends up. But uh, it's clear we're the principal sponsor at the moment, but I'm hopeful that's not going to last much longer. How long? Mm, within a year. I mean, there are already servers out there, and those servers are getting attention and hopefully traction. So uh, once the developers kick in, actually, once, once it's understood, the solid server we built, the enterprise solid server we built, is a foundation layer. 
Now it's, it's up to the developers to build applications to unlock the value we, we're, we're advocating. So, you know, give it a year, and I'm sure maybe within that, you'll see other businesses like Inrupt forming up, shaping up, and, and going after particular areas. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. And obviously, the internet has become a part of our daily lives. I use it all the time. And most people, when they wake up, will pick up their phone. And I just wonder, Tim, when you do that in the morning, what's the first thing you click on? Ooh. Uh, <laughs> I, sort of my, I have lived my life on the web since I started WTC, and everything was on the web. And so just uh, there's that. Uh, is there anything you look yeah. at in particular in the morning? Uh, probably news, probably a, a newspaper. Old uh, school. And, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, an, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, online, but, uh, but uh, well, it's, I guess com competition between news and the Gitter chat of, of, of the solid developers. Uh, that's uh, sort of stuff I check, I check on. What about you, John? Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm running a business that's got global footprints. So the first thing I do is see what's been going on while I've been asleep. <laughs> so, so I go to Slack and email and, and all the other various mechanisms we've got. You know, once, once Europe goes to sleep, America's still working. And once America goes to sleep, Asia's online. And, and it is what it is. We've got things going on on a global basis. So boring as it might sound, uh, my passion is the business to see what we can do to change this. I mean, it, it, you know, my kids, for the first time ever, are interested in what I do. I mean, they want this. You know, my mother, she's 90, she gets pretty, you know, she gets attended to by the healthcare system in the UK. She could have better healthcare. My friends, they're looking for jobs and so on. It's a rec they could have a better opportunity to, to get jobs. So, you know, that's what motivates me. So I, so I turn to what's going on in the business, and, and that's my passion. And I think healthcare is one of the most interesting applications of this. Like, Tim, how, how will this change how healthcare works? The, the dream oh, has been for uh, people in, uh, working in healthcare standardization for a long time has been that you, I have access to all my data. I've got it in my solid pod. Imagine that all of the data, no matter which country I've been living in, which doctor I've used, whether I've used private or public, but imagine that all of the testing, all of the x-rays I've got, uh, all of the, they're all stored in my solid pod in a way that when I share them with the doctor, the doctor can just pull them into all his diagnostic systems and so on. Now, the interoperable healthcare has been, uh, has been a, a dream. I, the NHSX is, is, a, is a one pushed in that direction in the UK. Uh, that, but I know that it's been really hard because the big healthcare companies, you, know, you, you think the big social network companies uh, you know, <coughs> don't want to let go of the reins. Well, you know, guess what? There's certain of the big uh, companies in medical and clinical data. But on the other hand, also, there's a, big, there's a massive uh, frustration with the fact that when you, when you look at all the clinical, if, if all of the data which we could have in our pods, if, that, if when the next time a pandemic comes, Imagine if we'd have all have had solid pods with varying amounts of data and the government had said, oh, can we have 0.1% of the population, 0.1% of the population, means volunteers, please to open up your medical data to us. And, and we also need medical data and travel data and friend data or something. And then a bunch of the UK people would have done that. And we'd have had immediately, we'd be able to do results. We'd be able to do sort of clinical trials automatically running across existing data by rerunning virtual experiments and so on. The sort of the power of being able to reuse clinical data is actually really important for lots of aspects of, uh, of medicine. So, meanwhile, there is a, if you talk to the people who are in the air, sort of the, around solid, who are in the medical clinical data area, they are passionate about that and the idea that maybe we will end up with getting interoperability for the first time because then even though you can't, those different hospitals won't connect to each other, actually they all have to connect to my pod. So, duh. And, and that, so we get the interoperability, and the pod becomes the place where the, where the interoperability happens. And your pod is where your personal data is stored. Mm. But I think a lot of people are quite concerned, I guess, about sharing their data as well. So how is privacy protected? Well, it starts off by being protected. Right? When you get something in your pod, start off with share it with nobody. I don't have to share it with anybody. 
uh, and that's what brings a lot of people to solid, is that, is the, you know, yes, I have the power to share it. That means I can start off with zero. And there are some data that I share with absolutely nobody, but actually very little. Hmm. When you look along most of, if you, just, if you just think about the data that I share with nobody, and all of the public data out there, sort of on the government data on the web, you omit most of my life. Most of my life is actually comparing stuff, talking about stuff with family, talking about stuff with friends, talking, you know, planning stuff with colleagues, putting to, planning a party, all, all these parties that we plan, all these, uh, all, all, all these projects that we make, uh, uh, all these things that we do on the web. In fact, we, you know, we do them on GitHub, but well, some, of them, some, of them, some of them are public, some of them are not. But most of the, most of the life is, between, is in, on the spectrum, mm. called the data spectrum. And so, in fact, what's great about Solid is actually it applies to that whole data spectrum. You can contribute to the world of open data by putting the uh, water quality at the bottom of your garden uh, as a public thing. Mm. You can keep your own personal medical state uh, by yourself, but most of your life is in between. And that's, you know, that's where the, actually the massive benefit is. That's where the value is, is, is in filling out the whole data spectrum from one to the other. And that's something only you need solid. For that. Great. Thank you yeah. so much. A hugely interesting space. I can't wait to see what happens next. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.